afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for excusing our delay. We are so happy to have the wonderful interpreter join us now. So we can begin our meeting of the Early Literacy Commission. We'll officially call our meeting to order, and we'll begin today by calling roll. Shanna Beaver. Present. Cindy Bishop. Stacy Bro. Present. Dr. Jenna Chaxon. Present. Dr. Susanna Craig. Here. Dr. Michelle DeMolinator. Here. Dr. Deborah Jo Haley. Richard Hartley. A proxy. A proxy for Mr. Richard. Dr. Lacey Hitt. Present. Dejanae Clark Jackson. Here. Dr. Tyree Jenkins. Here. Dr. Arthur Joffreon. Here. Dr. Kim McAllister. Dr. Ken Ortland. Here. Karen Robinson. Present. Robertson. Present. Dr. Libby Sanya. Here. Dr. Shalonda Stanley. <coughs> Dr. Allison Terio. Here. Stacy Billman. Monica Wisdorf. Here. Dr. Melanie Washington. Here. Ada Weber. Here. And Jayla Williams. Here. So we'll begin today, if you all don't mind, by doing a brief introduction of ourselves. This is a new commission, technically, um, and we have a lot of new faces that we're happy to have join us today. So we'll just go around, if you all don't mind, and say your name, your title, and who you are representing today. So I'll begin. I'm Jenna Shasson. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for the Office of Teaching and Learning here at the Department of Education. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Susanna Craig. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Academic Affairs, Student Success, and Innovation at the Louisiana Board of Regents, and I serve as co-chair on this commission. Hi, my name is Parker Boy. I'm a student worker in the Education Policy Office of the Governor. Um. Good afternoon, I'm Melanie Washington. I'm the director of the SICC, State and Agency Coordinating Council for Early Step, and I'm representing the Children's Cabinet. Hi, I'm Stacey Burrow. I'm the ELA coordinator from Washington Parish Schools. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dijon A. Clark Jackson. I serve as Vice President of Program Development at the Center for Literacy and Learning and I serve as a representative from Decoding Dyslexia, Peer and Advocate. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Allison Perio. I'm the Department Head of Teacher Education at Nichols State University. Hi, I'm Ashley Family. I'm the Associate Director of the School of Ed at the University of Louisiana Monroe, and I'm our Literacy and Reading Program Coordinator. Good afternoon, my name is Ada Weber, and I'm with Corey Jackson Instruction and the District Literacy Coach Leader for St. Cal Parish Public Schools. Hello, I'm Karen Robertson. I'm a principal at West Leesville Elementary, a first through fourth grade school, and I'm representing Vernon Parish. Hello, I'm Jayla Williams. I'm a senior at Brentwood State University, majoring in elementary education, and I'm here to represent all of the pre-service teacher candidates. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Tyron Jenkins. I am a regional literacy specialist with the Center for Literacy and Learning. 
Good afternoon. Um, I'm Michelle DeMolinier, and I am the manager of Early Childhood Initiatives and Literacy with the Board of Regents. Good afternoon. I'm Monica Lossdorf. I'm the director of special education at North Shore Charter School in Bogalusa, and I'm also the director of school and student services for the Louisiana Speech, Language, and Hearing Association. Libby Sonny, executive director of the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children. Good afternoon. Ken Orland, proud superintendent of St. Charles Parish Public Schools. Arthur Jofreon, Superintendent, Iberville Parish Schools, and I'm representing the Louisiana Association for School Superintendents. Chiana Bieber, Director of Literacy here in the department. So I think you all can tell going around the room that we really have, I think, a great meeting of the minds around literacy. Um, for sure, a lot of really passionate and qualified folks here to talk about literacy and how those literacy outcomes for the children of our state. So thank you all for joining us. So we'll move into the agenda for today's meeting and I will ask for a motion and a second to receive a report on the purpose of the Early Literacy Commission. Can I have a first? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Dr. Joffreon and Dr. Terrio with a second. So we thought it was important today to really ground everyone in the purpose of this commission and just give a little bit of history and background since we do have some new faces. So back in 2019 legislative session, um, the Early Literacy Commission was originally established, and they were asked to join together and make recommendations on developing and implementing an aligned system to provide effective evidence-based reading instruction for children from birth through third grade. In January of 2020, the commission produced this report, supporting our youngest readers, Louisiana Reads, and this report recommends a significant increase in the types of training and support available to reading teachers and an annual state investment of $15 million to carry out these efforts. This original 2019 commission was a two-year commission, and so in 2021, the commission produced an addendum to that original report, and in that addendum, the commission reaffirmed those 2020 goals from the original report and its recommendation of a $15 million annual state investment. The next two slides highlight the recommendations of both the original report that were then reaffirmed in the addendum report of the commission. And you'll see as I read through these recommendations, that a lot of these things we have seen and heard over the last two years in our state. And so although um, none of these are, will I say in an ideal state or a perfect state, we have seen movement in a lot of these areas from these original recommendations. The first of which is that high quality curriculum is used to teach students the foundations of reading. That every student who struggles to read receives timely research-based interventions, that the school, every school, has a culture in which all teachers are responsible for and equipped to deliver effective literacy instruction, and that every school leader maximizes the use of time and personnel through both scheduling and collaborative planning for the teachers. <coughs> the commission also recommended that Teachers effectively use evidence-based practices to meet the individual needs of each student. That educator preparation programs emphasize evidence-based literacy practices. That school systems implement comprehensive, a comprehensive literacy assessment plan and provides tools to be used throughout the year. That teachers use that literacy assessment data to monitor students' progress and then inform their instruction and that every school community expand opportunities so that parents and families can be engaged in children's literacy journey. 
So as I read over those, I saw a few of you throughout the room nod your heads. Yes, we have seen some movement, and I think even some success in some of these areas, but I know we would probably all say today some areas more than others, and we definitely still have work to do on this commission and in our state, and that's the reason that we're here today. And so the report addendum last year reaffirms the recommendation and asks for that $15 million investment again. But I do want to note that in the 2020 legislative session, the commission did have a win of securing $2 million of state funding to run a K-2 literacy coaching pilot that we did implement last school year. And so from that K-2 literacy coaching pilot, you'll hear in our next presentation about the current landscape of literacy, what were the findings around that coaching pilot? A lot of important work was done last year to take what we know to be true about literacy, those evidence-based best practices, implement them in a small subset of Louisiana schools, and use those findings and recommendations to do two things. One, to expand upon that pilot and have more coverage across the state, um, and also to continue that year one pilot into year two to say now that these initial foundations um, and this technical groundwork is laid, what comes next for literacy at a school? What comes in year two? We've also built on the progress um, in K-2 accountability. And so the original, one of the original recommendations was for a K-2 accountability system. And so the department has brought that proposal to Bessie. Um, we are still working with Bessie at this time to make some forward movement around K through second grade uh, accountability. And so that originated with the Early Literacy Commission. And so this year's commission, the 2021 Early Literacy Commission, um, is created by legislation from this past spring's legislative session to continue an Early Literacy Commission and to, to continue the commission around all of those original goals and also to add in um, for us to take a look at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on literacy in our state. So for us to stay true to all of those original goals, but also be cognizant of the fact that we are in a different environment for learning than we were back when the first literacy commission started a few years ago. So just to frame up our update for today, once again, thought it was important for you all to know the current landscape and where we are right now in literacy in our state. And so I wanted to begin by highlighting that the department um, did not have a team especially set aside for literacy. We had folks working on literacy across the department, but not a named team. And so Dr. Brumley, looked across the department and we were able to carve out um, a few staff members to create a division of literacy, which we have since then built upon. And so really tried to hire some of the, the best and brightest minds in literacy in our state to come and work in our division of literacy. Um, we're also going to highlight some of the progress. You all heard those recommendations and we wanted to dig in a little deeper to what some of what progress has been made around some of those recommendations. And then we also wanted to touch on 
this past legislative session, there was some very important literacy legislation um, that moved through last session that we wanted to highlight today and make sure everyone in the commission is aware of before we move into this year's commission work. So with that, I will turn it over to our Director of Literacy, Shanna Beaver, to present the current landscape of literacy. today to share with y'all a lot of the work that's come out of the Division for Literacy um, along with some of the other divisions along, um, across the department. So the first thing I would like to share with you is our division's mission and that is that Louisiana students will have improved literacy outcomes through high quality instruction and interactions by an effective teacher who is supported by leaders and families. So I'm just gonna let you take a second to look at this mission and maybe have a conversation with your neighbor around which words really jump out to you around this mission and maybe what are some thoughts as far as some actions that may need to happen in order for this mission to come forward. Students' literacy at all ages and stages. 
as well as partnering with community members and helping to maximize access for families. So you may have heard our campaign of Reading Revival. Dr. Brumley has coined this term as an effort to bring back our love for reading and putting early literacy as a priority. And so part of the supports that the division has begun releasing um, is including some resources and guidance that goes along with each one of the mentioned pillars. And that is available on our literacy library. So we've begun to um, expand our literacy library, but it is nowhere close to where we want it to be. And we will continue to put out um, resources and guidance as we receive feedback from the commission, um, as well as our visits in the field. And then we've also been providing professional development around these resources. So this past uh, summer, we were lucky enough to expand our team. So we, were, we added on, we have two of our members that we added on here, Sarah Stolman Zaffaro and Katasha Edwards, and they have led our teacher and leader PDs that we began over the summer. And those webinars, along with the resources that go with them, are also located on our Literacy Library page. And so we've set a goal, um, a statewide literacy goal. So as we know, the way that our states get ranked across the nation is through NAEP. And so we have set a goal that we will increase our scale score by 10 points by 2027 on the NAEP fourth grade ELA assessment. We used Mississippi as a model um, in setting our goal. So we looked at when Mississippi began their journey in developing legislation and policy around literacy, and then when they started the work of training their teachers and leaders. So if you look at the year that they began that training, the next year's kindergartners took that 2019 NAEP fourth grade assessment that pretty much put Mississippi on the map and showed all the growth that they had made around early literacy. And so if we look at this year, starting all of our trainings with our teachers and leaders, and we look at next year's cohort of kindergartners, when they take the 2027 fourth grade ELA NAEP um, assessment, that is where we're hoping to see our 10 point scale score. Of course, we're wanting to see improvement along the way. So we're hoping for next, um, for the 2023 NAEP, which is um, this year's third graders to increase by two points and then see it increase by five points on the 2025 NAEP assessment, which is this year's current first graders. So again, we launched our K-2 literacy coaching pilot um, as a result of the commission's recommendations to develop a coaching model that we can scale out across the state. So last year we had 13 literacy coaches and two regional literacy specialists that supported those coaches and their schools. And that was funded through the $2 million Early Literacy State Fund that we received through legislation. We are excited to say that we were able to expand this pilot statewide through our Comprehensive Literacy State Development Grant along with some ESSER funds. And we currently have, across the state, 221 literacy coaches that are in our CIR, UIRA schools. I will note that the school system was able to opt into this funding through our super app. Some chose to opt through and place these literacy coaches, and some chose not to. Um, those who chose not to had an established um, system in their, in their district um, where they were supporting their literacy work. We also have 16 regional literacy specialists um, across the state that are supporting our coaches. And then, as Jenna had mentioned before, our pilot schools from last year have continued into a year two pilot so that they continue to provide us with data and next steps that we will continue to implement statewide. So some of our key findings from our pilot from year one that also led to those four literacy pillars 
was that goal setting is essential. Again, all the way from the school system to the school to the teacher to the student level and communicating those goals with families and progress monitoring those goals along the way. Time and materials matter. So it was essential to set literacy block schedules and that teachers had time to ensure that students were, had access to the tier one curriculum as well as small group instruction time to provide those interventions and extensions for students based on their need. Intensive professional development is necessary. Our teachers and leaders in our pilot began the journey in the Foundations of Literacy training that also helped to develop our um, Act 108 that we're excited that all of our teachers and leaders K-3 will have access to this training across the state. And then also providing that job embedded support for teachers. So it's one thing to go through the training, but it's another thing in supporting our teachers in the application of that new learning in the classroom. And to start looking at that student work and seeing what does the student work tell us about where our students are at and how to support them. And then of course families are an important part of a child's literacy journey. And the school plays a large role in supporting our families in that journey. So just a couple pictures that we took um, last year while visiting some of our pilot schools. And some of the shifts that we began to see as our teachers were going through the training and they started having some aha moments about, you know, why are some of the things that are in their curriculum there? So for example, phonemic awareness. Sometimes those activities may seem really simple, and when trying to save time, they skip over those. But as they've been going through the trainings, they've been learning about the importance of all the parts of um, literacy development and why those pieces are there within their curriculum. We started seeing them using, for example, their um, chaining folders in CKLA as they started to realize the importance of, of students manipulating those graphemes and um, and using the, the cards to show their knowledge. We also began to see, again, the emphasis on small group instruction and providing that targeted intervention and then progressing, I mean, progress monitoring them along the way and ensuring that that was a key component in the literacy block. We also made some, as a department, made some moves toward a K-2 accountability system. And so we are currently working on and designing a K-2 accountability system that's aligned to our academic strategy and our state standards so that we can bridge the gap between early childhood and 312 accountability. With the hopes to implement in 2023-24, and of course, designing that strategy around supporting our K-2 classrooms and incorporating a multi-tiered system of support. Another action in the recommendation of um, the Early Literacy Commission was the development of an ELA collaborative. And this opportunity um, allowed for 28 participants from our teacher preparation programs and our K-12 system, uh, systems to come together to develop a model methods course that aligns K-12 higher education and research-based best practices. And so those 28 um, participants from the first collaborative met together to design this model course syllabus. And now as a second part of the collaborative, the members um, from the first collaborative are now mentoring other um, teacher preparation program members in helping them to align their course syllabus to the model. And then I wanted, of course, to highlight our family literacy engagement. So in an effort to support this work, the division um, hosted a family literacy engagement work group where they came together and designed um, a strategy that really included an exhaustive list of ideas and strategies to promote 
family literacy engagement and also incorporating those community partners. That is now shared on our website. And then as an extension of that, we've begun to release what we're calling our family grab and go activities where they're just one pagers that families can send home to, with students with little activities that they could easily do at home and some, also some activities that schools could do at the school level to support this work. And then we're excited we should be releasing soon um, an additional piece where some literacy activities that are built out by age um, that families can use all the way from birth and up. So I'm gonna pause right here before Jenna talks about the legislation that happened in the spring to see if we have any questions or comments around the work that we've been currently doing. Related to the accountability with K2, um, I know that there's been discussion of mirroring it off of what we have with the birth tutorial and the early childhood system and using the class instrument for that accountability. I'm wondering if there's been discussion related to a literacy observation tool that could be used with teachers coupling with the class observation tool? So we have. We've actually had um, some really great conversation with Teachstone about that in particular, because um, Teachstone is working on some literacy indicators and look for in classrooms, so we have had conversations with Teachstone about incorporating that in so that we wouldn't only have our literacy indicator component, um, but the literacy screener component of the accountability system, but we would also have some key literacy look-fors um, in the observations. Yeah, because in the observations as it is now, it's, it wouldn't hone in on literacy per se. So are they developing their own and norming them just for Louisiana, or is that just an overall goal that they're trying to do within the system? I don't want to speak for Teachstone, <laughs> but I do believe they're doing it overall. Because the, the thought behind it is, is like if we're really, are focusing on that K2 literacy space, we want an instrument that obviously helps teachers know whether they might be struggling and they don't know, and that then you could do targeted coaching um, to be able to support those teachers. And I'm curious to uh, hear more about the ELA Collaborative. I know from the Board of Regents perspective, we would, I'd love to see with the model core, you said a model methods course. I don't know how far along you are in the process, but I know from our perspective, uh, Dr. Molinari and I would like to, to see that. Well, we have two members in here that participate on that collaborative, and one of them would like to share their experiences. Hi. Great. Um, oh, good. Glad to know you're on the group. <laughs> um, so I think it's really nice. Um, we developed a syllabus. Like, and it's, it's, it's not really a syllabus, really. It's much like a course outline. And um, with assessments and resources, I felt like that was the most valuable part to me, was just you know, being able to find and locate resources from the teacher prep perspective. For example, when we're teaching writing, um, I teach a junior block level course, and my students don't have an opportunity to, they're not residents yet, so they don't have classrooms, so they can't pull up 25 samples of writing. And so finding different resources that, that were there and putting our heads together and I'm kind of learning what's happening already. I'm um, happy to know that I feel like Bill is doing a great job with all those things. Like I can check that box and say they're doing those things. Um, but right now, I believe it's in draft form. It's on the, on the website. You can go and look and see what's there. Um, there's a math mod method one as well that, that's formalized and you can kind of see how it mirrors. Um, it's all standards aligned. So especially standards, competency, um, changes there. Um, so that prep providers can see their accreditation's not in danger if they want to um, adopt some of these or you know, how it would look. It's kind of interesting because it's, you know, not there's not gonna be one course we can take and learn everything you need to know, right? Right. And so especially from a prep provider's perspective, everything that that collaborative, everything that the course outline entails happens across, I think, three different courses in our prep program. And so we're, we're meeting with faculty to kind of see where their piece is and what they're already doing and what they need to be doing kind of thing. Um, and I'll, I'm able to be in the second group too, so I'm mentoring a colleague who teaches a, you know, a different level of that. Um, but that, that's my thought. 
Great. Just curious, and, and, and about implementation, where are we on, on implementation? You said it's in draft form. I'm just curious. Are people being receptive to it? Well, I don't want to speak for all people. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> are, you, are you receptive to it? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. Right, right, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, yes. And so, I mean, I can think, and I, and, I, and I feel like I've developed a lot of our literacy courses at ULM, and, and we were doing, I feel like, a great job in our foundation courses, and I feel like our, our students can speak to that, and, and we can create positive detail about them. Um, and so I thought we were doing a lot of those things. And um, so, and I and just meeting with faculty and the faculty member that I mentor, and she's like, okay, this, this is good. I, again, I was more excited about the opportunity to hear what's happening across the state and how other set providers were meeting challenges and having the opportunity to have district members to say, oh, here's this website that you can get all the student writing samples that you could dream of. Um, mm -hmm. The Vermont Audience Library, for example. And that was fantastic. Um, Hearing that, you know, the things that they value and what's important, um, having an opportunity, you know, which I love that we have a teacher press, we have a teacher candidate on this commission, because I feel like, you know, hearing, you know, what they've learned, how does that translate into what they're doing, kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, I, I think they're pretty perceptive. Um, that's good. That's good. I just wanted to hear more about it, so I'll. Yeah. Could I, could I ask a related question? I'd like to piggyback. Um, I was just curious, is the syllabus, are we getting to the point in, in where we're including those foundational pieces that we know are so important, like the phonological awareness and phonics and those pieces as opposed to like a whole language type approach is what I've been dying to know um, so, how that's going. Um, so again, so it's not a syllabus, but it's a course outline. Okay. Um, and again, speaking for me, I don't know any prep providers who are not using those foundations of literacy already. So all every syllabi I've ever seen across the state specifically addresses contemporary yeah. response, literacy, literacy. I mean, they were all there. Yeah. No one's teaching school. Right? I think, um, and I can speak from the university I attended and the next, I won't name the university, but we did. Um, my, you know, my university did address those pieces, but it also taught me um, the, you know, running records and how to guess at picture clues and all of those other things that are in conflict with what we know is good, good science. So I was just curious if we had gotten like to that level of, of teacher prep. The work was grounded in reading science and there are phonological awareness uh, parts of that curriculum or those uh, suggested resources. So the research we did read and study as part of the collaborative was grounded in the work of the science of reading. And so those uh, activities and those lessons are coming more out of that with phonemic awareness and phonics. So it, it is grounded in that work. That's great, thank you. I have a follow-up to that. So as a branch of the original work of the first Literacy Commission, we did have several meetings um, as a committee to determine the number of hours that universities were going to spend. And we came up with several different models where it could be um, a, a sort of a stepping stone for the, the science of reading, or it could be taught over several courses where you deepen the knowledge. Do we know what the outcome of those meetings were? Because as a committee member, I don't recall ever receiving a final report on what was going to be presented. I don't know what the that was. It's gone back before my time. <laughs> um, I, I know that um, there is still the nine hours of required reading coursework. So I'm not exactly sure what that committee was asking for, but I know there is there are those nine hours um, still present in the required coursework for teacher preparation. Well, one, one of the things that, that was being discussed was the fact that several universities had differing views on the, the presentation of the science of reading. Um, uh, Louisiana Tech, I know, was specifically mentioned as a model because of the extensive requirement that they had for all of their teacher prep candidates, whereas several of other universities only skimmed the surface. And so the goal of the work 
was to come up with varying ways that universities, I hate to use the word accountability, but so that universities would ensure that the students were coming out prepared. Because as, as a school system representative, we at, in the district are currently working with letters. We're doing our science of reading training for all of our pre-K through third grade teachers as well as special education teachers across the board and middle school teachers as well. Um, however, we cannot continue to fund the extensive cost of that, so we're hoping that the universities will then in turn send those graduates prepared for the teaching of that foundational reading and then the district can support that rather than constantly provide that training. And that's the only reason I bring up that branch of work that we did from the original literacy commission. I would have to agree as a principal um, with 75% of my staff with five years or less experience um, that it would be extremely beneficial if the teachers coming out of college had more depth of knowledge of the science of reading because we too are spending quite a bit of dollars on tra training on the science of reading, kind of um, retraining from past knowledge to current I, I just think it would be great for us as this commission to sort of get that report because not only are we dealing with what we have to do in our school systems now or our organizations, but we do have to constantly and consistently have our teachers prepared. You know, when we talk about the, the first year teacher and the struggle, and if they're coming in already facing so many challenges that they're not really prepared for, and then they don't understand the science of reading or the foundations of teaching reading, we're expecting them to fail. So I, I would love to ask if we could perhaps get a report on the progress of that work. Absolutely, and I think you'll like some of the legislative session updates, Dr. Joffrey, on because it does include um, some parts around teacher preparation in Act 438, um, and that's actually some of where this commission is going. We will be um, breaking into some optional work groups and digging more into that legislation, and one is specifically around teacher preparation providers and what can we do, things like the ELA Collaborative that I know goes such a long way to bring folks together um, to really talk about what's best for our teacher preparation campus and then ultimately what's best for our children. And so I think we're absolutely headed in that direction. And then sorry to, to be so uh, loquacious, but um, Shanna, just a question for you. You introduced the two young ladies in the back. So from a district perspective, what type of work are they doing so that if there is a need in a district, who would we contact and around what, what specific work? Yeah, I'll say, I'll jump in and I'll say that we have like a few different layers. So we do have our partnership for um, the Center for Literacy and Learning that helps provide our literacy specialists across the state. Those specialists focused are in the schools that have literacy coaches funded. And so that those specialists are an extension of our literacy division, if we think about it in those terms, where they are pushing into the schools to support the school system leader, support the school leader, and ultimately support that literacy coach in the work that they do. Um, and then we also have our literacy division um, that supports all of our schools. And those supports are the resources, like Ken talked about earlier, on literacy library. It's the ongoing professional learning, professional development that we offer. Do you want to? Can expand on that, well, and I was just going to add that the team would be more than happy. Any any school system that would like to, you know, include us on some walks and some partnerships and some as a thought partner. Um, we've been really excited that we get to go into the field. We've we've gotten to go to a few this year. Um, actually, we got to um, visit Miss Robertson's um, school recently. And um, we had lots of visits planned, and then the hurricane kind of threw that off a little bit. So we're excited to kind of get back out and go across the state and visit some schools as well. And you can always put in a request at Louisiana Literacy at LA.com. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I could just say I uh, really applaud the efforts of the state. For so many years, it was very frustrating to see that K-3 kind of world. The bookends were getting the most support and attention. 
And while I have the opportunity to participate on the project and the family engagement and see that, I see now the setup of both of those pieces needing to be in place as the work goes deeper in the K-3 initiative. And just from a perspective of uh, supporting K-3 and literacy my entire career, I can't, I can't even contain my excitement for the work that's about to happen because when we have teachers that are prepared to incorporate and implement any curriculum, regardless of what it is, but that know how to target support and intervention for our students, and that's what the work of the collaborative and the long-term student, as well as the new state initiatives, then we will yield the results that we're expecting to get from our literacy. So I'm just very thankful for this. Practicing some wait time. <laughs> Making sure we have no other questions or comments. It's okay if something comes to you in a few minutes. But we will move into the remainder of our update, which is around our spring 2021 legislative session. We had several pieces of legislation related to literacy that passed through this past session. The first of which is a House resolution that requests the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education to develop a plan for providing school literacy coaches for students in kindergarten through second grade in elementary schools identified as needing improvement. And so we know that some of this work is already done. We're not at 100%. And so we are happy to um, investigate in this study, explore and research and make a plan and report back to the legislature about how, um, how this can come to fruition and how we can have an effective um, school-based literacy coach in all of the schools that represent that need. The next piece of legislation is Act 415 um, that creates a literacy program for public school students and this is specifically for students who demonstrate a, um, that they are below grade level in reading. Um, and this is a bill that provides tutoring for those students in the form of a parent voucher to find a tutor to tutor the child in literacy if they are below grade level in their literacy skills. This particular piece of legislation was passed but not funded this past session. And so the Department of Education has decided to use $40 million of their ESSER set-aside funds, so some of their COVID stimulus dollars, um, in order to fund some portion of this as far as that $40 million will go to serve the students of our state. And so we are in the early processes um, of working through procurement and legal issues and identifying um, really like an outreach arm, basically vendors to work with who would provide tutoring services for students um, based on the preference of the parent. So it would be the in the form of a voucher and given to every student reading below grade level. So we are in the early stages of that because once again it was passed by the state but it was not funded and so we're going to use some of those um, set aside funds in order to fund this. Senate Resolution 133 is for this commission so that I think is a very important piece of literacy legislation that recreates this early literacy commission. And Act 419 requires the reporting of students identified as having dyslexia. This basically shores up how we report students with dyslexia in our state. And so the next two we'll dive a little deeper into because these are actually, these acts actually stem from recommendations of the Early Literacy Commission. So the first of which is Act 108, the other is Act 438, and Act 108 Oh, yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to ask a question before you move into the deeper um, legislative pieces. For Act 415, going back, that's the one that creates the tutoring program for parents to initiate for, um, for services for their children. Love that um, it puts that onus on parents to be able to make that determination 
A couple of questions surrounding that. I know you say you're in the infancy stages of that. Do we have a projected date for the implementation for that program? So our goal is summer. <clears throat> the goal would be that we would have this stood up by summer so that parents interested in utilizing those tutor vouchers for <coughs> summer learning, that those would be in place. It's an ambitious goal because mm -hmm. um, you know, the procurement process, um, finding and selecting vendors to do this work will be, it's very time consuming, yeah. um, and it is a long process, but the goal is summer. Yeah, I was gonna ask about a sort of a, a where will be a, a database, I know you'll work through the, the logistics of that, but obviously making this program accessible for parents to be able to easily and quickly navigate that so it's more efficient for them. Is there gonna be any grade level stipulation, you know, on, that so that has not been determined yet. That's part of um, determining how those funds could best be spent since the 40 million is not what the legislation called for, which was much more. So if I could just add the, the sort of our two cents on the parent side, we know that this, especially when we talk about COVID-19 emphasis and the work that we're doing here, we've missed an entire generation of assisting students in their struggle. So this work has to be accessible and is most valuable when it's accessible for students beyond second grade. I know we're in the K-2 space here, but we know that we're leaving behind those middle high school supports. And this is just one way parents can be engaged with that remediation. We're in the prevention stage here, but we do need to um, have emphasis on the remediation piece. So I would just note that that's important for, um, for parents to have access to that. And to, the, to Act 419, that reporting phase, um, I know that's working with a different department and probably have to go do special ed. Is there a targeted date on that reporting outcome? So that reporting, again, was set back slightly by the hurricane, but I actually think that reporting, it's um, part of that was collected through our October 1st count and then part of it is coming through some different avenues of data collection, but I do believe we'll have that by December. Thank you. Okay. So diving a little more deeply into Act 108 and Act 438. Act 108 requires early literacy training for kindergarten through third grade teachers and school leaders based on the science of reading. It requires extensive training in phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. And it requires reporting from the school systems to the department on successful training completion. And the reporting of successful completion begins on May 1st. So where we are right now in this process is the legislation asks the department to create a list of qualified vendors for school systems to then choose from. So we worked through an RFA process to identify vendors deemed as high quality in providing this level of intensive Literacy Foundations training. And so we've produced that vendor guide, that list for our school systems to choose from. Our school systems have now gone through, they are in the process of choosing their vendor based on their system and their system needs. They get to choose their vendor from that list that they want to then contract with to provide the training for their kindergarten through third grade teachers and the school leaders for kindergarten through third grade. The department, once again, has decided to use some of our ESSER set-aside funds to fund this training for those teachers. So through their applications, their grant applications, school systems are able to say what vendor they're selecting. There are some price differences between the vendors on the list, which vendor they're selecting off the list, and how many teachers and leaders they're training. And so they're able to ask for those funds through their grant application process with us as a department. So we are fully funding through ESSER funds um, the Literacy Foundations training required in Act 108. So that's where we are at this point in time. I was actually on a call this morning with superintendents saying the time is now. Let's get
get this off the ground and running. The legislation actually gives them a few years of a runway to get this done, but we're really trying to encourage school systems. Let's dive in now. Let's really incentivize this for teachers. Let's make sure that they have the time and the space that they need to engage in the training and really plan to implement it in their classrooms. Because it is um, very time consuming training. It's a lot of new learning for some of our teachers. And so we really want to encourage our school systems to be aware of that and give show teachers the grace and the flexibility to engage in that training and then implement it. I have a question. With that, will our residents be able to attend that training as well with them? So two things to add there. We have encouraged our school systems to include their residents in the training, knowing that they will be your, our future um, teachers. And then the second thing I'll add is that I've secured some um, of our comprehensive literacy state development funds that we hold as a state to also invite all prep provider um, professors who are teaching the literacy courses. And so I know there's currently a survey out that was released through the newsletter that Nicole Bono you know, from the department is collecting on the list where you can choose which of the four vendors you would like to also get trained in. And we're, we're going to fund that as well. And uh, would that be in uh, collaboration with the local school district, or would that be a separate training for prep providers? They, we could go either way. If they'd like to choose to go in with the local system, they could. But um, we'll create a cohort um, on the side as well. Because that would be really great to yeah, that's a good our idea. bigger universities to have. Uh, those uh, prep providers along with our teachers, I, I think that would be a, a great option to have. All right, so we will move into Act 438 that I will overview, um, but in work group, we'll dig in a little deeper to Act 438 and what it means for these different areas. Um, but Act 438 is a longer, more comprehensive um, piece of literacy legislation. I will say I like to think of Act 438 and Act 108 really working in tandem. Um, so it's great that both of them passed. Act 438 includes a call for early literacy instruction for K-3 students. So when we think about some of the things that this commission recommend, recommended, um, like high quality materials, effective instruction, individualized instruction based on student needs. That's embedded within Act 438. It also calls for an annual literacy assessment of students. It calls for literacy supports for certain students. So once again, when we're thinking about our students who are reading below grade level, it calls for um, really clear intentional supports for those students. Um, it also acts for school literacy plans. So for schools and school systems to develop literacy plans about how they are doing all of these things. So how are we meeting the needs of every student? How are we using the data to inform instruction? And it requires annual literacy reporting by schools. Shannon, did you want to add anything else about 438? So the only thing I'll add is um, this current year we're supporting our school systems in developing their literacy plans um, with the plans to have um, some support and guidance around school literacy plans next year. And part of that act requires the school to have that plan on their website along with um, their student scores from that literacy assessment. The next slide is just a overview timeline of 108 and 438 um, and when it starts with developing that list for approved vendors that we have out right now um, all the way to given that runway once again um, to 2023 for folks to select that vendor and implement their training with the vendors in China um, in the past, vendors have been so tightly tied to curriculum. Is this a deviation for that to allow more flexibility for districts to get what they need? So that's a really excellent question, Libby. Um, so this training, the trainings in particular, 
are, and if you look at the vendors who are on the list, and we can certainly get that to you all, especially as you um, get deeper in the work and in the work group discussions, it is more, those vendors are doing training that is more explicitly around the science of reading, reading foundations. Um, they are not explicitly tied to a curriculum or even multiple curriculum. Good, I mean, that's been the issue. Mm -hmm. It was so tied to curriculum that like, District had no flexibility, um, and then it, it was really harmful to high quality vendors to be able to support districts with those needs. Kudos, fine. I do think it will be important. I'll note though as well. I think it will be really important um, for school systems to work through what that means then, because I think it will be important to me when I think about the Act 108 training and this literacy foundations training for teachers. Shanna said something a little while ago about the teachers who underwent the training um, in the literacy coaching pilot last year had a lot of aha moments around, this is why the curriculum asked me to do this. This is why I shouldn't skip this part. Um, so I think to me, um, the literacy foundations training will help bring to life the curriculum in a way that teachers need at this point. So it will help them learn, I think, at a deeper level, more than any just singular curriculum-based training could, it will help them learn how to use and manipulate their curriculum to best meet the needs of every student. That's great. I, I can also add, just because we've been training letters in our district for years, um, it really helps teachers to start to evaluate their curriculum, you know, and, and pinpoint problems. And so we just tell teachers, you know, we have to be smarter than our programs and our curricula. And it absolutely, I can speak to that. It's, you know, um, I'm sure all of the vendors on the list are high quality, but we just specifically are a letters district. And it definitely has helped us to, to do that in Washington, 100%. So now that you said that um, we kind of look, we're looking towards Mississippi as a model of implementation and how this commission works, um, have we, also thought about looking at other states who have consistently higher scores on NAEP and literacy and, and evaluating what it is that they do in their P-12 schools? Yeah, that's a great question. So for one thing I'll say, Mississippi has gone ahead. Mississippi is known and what, what makes them like special, and I'll say bright and shiny and why folks have turned from across the country is that they were in one year the only state in the last year that NAEP reporting was done prior to COVID, they were the only state to show growth um, in fourth grade ELA. And so, you know, everyone turned and said, what have they been doing? And you look back, it wasn't just that year, it's what they had, it's the legislation they put in place seven years prior that had an impact on that data. And so for sure, we're looking at Mississippi um, and even we, we know our colleagues in Mississippi and talk to them often um, and we know that you know they'll tell you as well that like they had some they had some hits and they had a few misses too they're like we should have put more in this and maybe a less a little less here um, but definitely there are other states that we have looked at that we continue to look at and talk to Tennessee is one who I know has passed some literacy legislation in the past Texas has passed some literacy legislation in the past so I think there are lots of states across the country um, that we have looked at, we continue to look at. Um, we encourage you all to and, and, and bring to the table here and to us as we, as we talk about what might be, because this is, I feel like this legislation that we just talked about is step one. And so what comes next for our state? How do we strengthen what we've done already? And I'll just add in that we have a lot of different collaboratives that we participate in. So um, Excel and Ed is one where they bring together a lot of the, the literacy leaders across the nation from each of the agencies, and we're able to have collaboratives and share our ideas. Um, and we, it's also a place where they support in, hey, we're, maybe this is a problem of practice for us, but someone else is, has made a lot of movement in that area, and we're able to learn from them, so they'll help to connect. And just recently, we've had Marilyn actually reach out to us for us to share some of our things. So it's been exciting to, to also now, not just to be on the receiving end, but also to be able to, to help other states as well. And Shanna, I can add, we, we have our relationship with Amy Pathway, and they keep telling me out in the national circuit, they said all eyes are on Louisiana right now. So they keep saying eyes on Louisiana. So 
And I think the important thing to note about why we can is so special <laughs> <laughs> is because when we look at the landscape of our, our state, they're so similar. And the important part about Mississippi is that they move the needle for even for their subgroups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we know that those mm -hmm. subgroups yeah. need the most emphasis on, on what it is that we're doing here. And the fact that they were able to move, there are several states that we've looked at as an organization that are doing great work, but they didn't have the need to move those groups. They're sort of maintaining the work that they've done. And so I think that's the reason that Mississippi is important to look at and see what are those, you know, specific implementations. And of course, what we know is that it didn't happen overnight, that's for sure. <laughs> so to know that, what that process looked like, and especially targeting those most vulnerable students and being able to move them was important for us. And I, I want to jump on what you just said. I mean, I, I'm really impressed with the poll. Is it reasonable time? I mean, everybody wants reform to happen immediately. But you know, you, sometimes you do need to have the time to, to train teachers to get students to actually grow up from kindergarten into they take this test. So I was really pleased to see that the goal is 2027. out of this commission, what are you interested in diving a little more into, 
and it's really important to us in this commission. We know that we have a lot of things in place. There has been some important groundwork laid, but we know there is much work to do. And it is the task of this commission to help serve with that implementation. Um, we at the department don't know everything about the challenges that our teacher preparation providers face, the challenges that our school systems face. And so it's important that we hear all of that and that we have everyone's input um, to make sure that the implementation of all of this groundwork that's already laid is ultimately successful. And so we plan to accomplish that through a series of work groups. And so these are optional work groups. I'll start by saying that they will be held virtually. Um, and each work group will meet two times prior to the next commission meeting. And so we have heard what you all want to dig more into. And these are up on the screen. One is family engagement. Another being curriculum and materials, teacher preparation, explicit literacy interventions and extensions, and literacy coach expansion. And so we will send a follow-up email directly after today's meeting asking everyone to select a top two work groups um, that you are most interested in participating in. And these work groups will be basically collaborative planning discussions where folks will be able to look at some documents a little deeper, get a lay of the land, provide some input and guidance prior to coming into our next whole group commission meeting. And so we're asking everyone to pick a top two in hopes that we can even it out some um, and we don't have everyone just, just clustered in one group or two groups. And so we ask that you pick your top two work groups. Um, but everyone would ultimately participate in only one work group um, unless you really, really have a desire to be in two, that's okay too. And if you are feeling like I am on the commission, I'm okay to just receive updates from these work groups and recommendations from the work groups and I'd rather just serve on the commission and not participate in the work groups, that's fine as well. So we'll send out the email immediately following today so you can choose your top two and we'll kick those off in two weeks. So you'll hear back from us next week with the dates and times of those virtual work group meetings. We can dig in a little deeper in small groups. Dr. Chasson, one thing when we started the meeting, we talked about the, a little bit about K2 accountability, how to be in push. Will there be any discussions relative to that? Or guidance to work around that so that we can also provide feedback to Bessie relative to K2 accountability? So that is a good question. I think this group can absolutely discuss it and provide some input, but I will say that um, we do have an accountability commission, and so it is the task of the accountability commission to do that work in particular, but I certainly think we can hear and carry forth any input and recommendations from this group as well.
Post, yes. Post video yeah. to feed. Yeah. No, that I don't care.